Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Well, good morning. How are we doing? My name is Timothy Atik. I'm the Executive Director of Vertical Ministries in Waco, Texas. It is a privilege to get to be here with you for a second week in a row. Uh, I always love my time here at Faithbridge, so excited about what the Lord has in store for us today. Uh, I want to start by just telling you about a significant time in my life. Uh, I will never forget the night of November 14th, 2007, I was in Dallas speaking to a group of high school and middle school students, and after the service, uh, I walked outside and I checked my phone, saw that I had a voicemail from a guy from college I hadn't talked to in a while, and he left me a voicemail letting me know that one of my closest friends from college had passed away. Uh, He had gotten killed by an IED serving our country in Iraq. And that moment was extremely significant for me because that was one of the first times that I really had to confront or I was confronted by unexpected loss. One of my first times to really deal with unexpected loss. As I kind of stepped away from Pete's death and and as I reflected upon that time in my life, I realized two things about death. I realized that death does two things, and I want to share it with you this morning. The first thing that death does is, is it always brings people together. I remember getting that news and going over to a friend's apartment where uh, several of us just gathered together, and we spent the rest of the evening uh, laughing together, crying together, sharing stories, because that's what death will do, is it will bring people together. You might have experienced that before in your life. If you've ever encountered unexpected loss, you might find yourself in a room with people you haven't seen in a while. You might find yourself hugging people that you don't really like, because death has actually brought, <laughs> brought people together. That's the first thing that death will do. The second thing that death always does is it prompts you to answer a question, and here's the question. What do you really believe to be true about God? I remember driving down the toll road in Dallas, just kind of crying my eyes out, dealing with feelings towards God that I really had never experienced in my life, because in that moment, I was prompted to answer a question, what do I really believe to be true about God? Can God really be trusted? Is God really in control and sovereign over all things? That's what, the, that's what death will do. And the reason that I share that with you this morning is that we're going to step into a story in the scriptures and we're going to see a woman who encounters the unexpected loss of her brother. And we're going to see death do its two things. I want you to know this story that we're going to look at today, it is going to have everything to do with every single one of us in this room. So if you have a Bible, I want you to turn with me this morning to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. If you will, go ahead and find verse 17. (coughs) Excuse me. And before we start reading in verse 17, let me go ahead and just fill you in on what's been going on in John chapter 11. At the beginning of the chapter, three characters are introduced to us. There's Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. The three are siblings, and the text is very clear that they have a very close relationship with Jesus Christ. It tells us that Jesus loves these three people. Lazarus, the brother, gets sick, so sick to the point that Martha and Mary send word to Jesus and they say, you better get here. You better come quickly. But then the, the scriptures take an interesting turn because it tells us that Jesus stays where he is for two more days. During that two-day period that Jesus 
stayed away from Bethany where Lazarus was. Lazarus ends up dying. Jesus knows that Lazarus has died because he's God. He rallies his friends, the disciples, and they make their way to Bethany to go and see Martha and Mary and ultimately Lazarus. And on the way to Bethany, Jesus is going to have two conversations with the two sisters of Lazarus. He has a conversation first with Martha, then a conversation with Mary. The conversation I want us to focus on this morning is the one that he has with Martha. And we pick it up in verse 17. And right here, we're gonna see death do its two things. It says this. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. That's the first thing death does, is it brings people together. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know. I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then a question is asked. Do you believe this? Martha said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. This moment in Martha's life where her life collides with the unexpected loss of her brother. And in this sobering moment, she comes face to face with God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ makes a phenomenal statement about himself. And after he makes this statement, he looks at Martha and he says, do you believe this? See, that's the second thing that death does is it always prompts you to answer a question. What do you really believe to be true about God? Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. We said last week that seven different times in the book of John, Jesus makes these definitive statements about himself and every statement begins with the two words, I am. They're known as the seven I am statements. Jesus declares here, I'm the resurrection and the life. I really want you to get your mind and heart around what Jesus is saying in this statement. The good news for us is that Jesus actually unpacks his statement for us in the, in the next two verses. Let's just look real quick. What does Jesus mean? He declares in verse 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. Then he explains it. Here's what it means. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. What's Jesus mean? He means this. I am the one and only way to experience eternal life in heaven with God after you die. That's what he's saying. He is spelling it out. He doesn't say, I am a good source of resurrection in life. I am one of many ways for resurrection in life. He says, I am the Resurrection and the life. If you want to experience eternal life in heaven with God after you die, it is going to have absolutely everything to do with believing in Jesus Christ. He goes on. He unpacks the statement, being the resurrection and the life, even more. He says, first, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And then everyone who lives and believes in me shall never Die. I love this statement because here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying eternal life isn't something that begins the day you die. Eternal life is something that begins the day you believe. You can actually begin to taste what life will be like in heaven now. Because Jesus Christ, when he enters your life, he can actually give you a new life that begins now and lasts for all of eternity. And when you die physically, that new spiritual life doesn't end, it just gets better. That's his point. 
Put those two things together. When Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life, here's what he's saying. He's saying, I am the one and only one who can raise you to a new life that begins now and lasts for all of eternity in heaven with God. And then he looks at Martha and he asks her one of the most important questions she'll ever have to answer in her life. Do you believe this? Very significant question for Martha. Very significant question for us here today. Because this question, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? This isn't just a question for Martha. This is a question for every single person in this room. You can either answer it today or you can wait till you experience unexpected loss in your life, but you will come to these moments where you are prompted to answer a question. What do you really believe to be true about God? Jesus declares, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Maybe you already feel like you know the answer to that question, and if that's you, great. But before you answer it, I want you to hold off on answering the question right now until you see how the story plays out. Because what happens next is Jesus is going to give us a physical display of the spiritual reality that he just unpacked for Martha. Isn't that great? That's how God works. He wants it to be absolutely clear. So, hey, here's a physical demonstration display of the reality I just unpacked. For you. By the way, this is my favorite story in the entire Bible, so I love getting to teach it. Turn with me now to verse 38 and watch what happens. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, rightfully said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I love this story because I, it's such a great story to try and put yourself into. That's what I want you to do right now. I want you to try and step into this story. Imagine you and a group of people follow Jesus out to the tomb where Lazarus is buried. So here we are amidst a big group of people just staring at a rock because he's not buried in the ground. He is buried in a tomb and a stone has been rolled in front of it. So we are standing there. There is awkward silence and no one is doing anything. And then Jesus makes this incredibly inappropriate request. He says, uh, roll away the stone. That's like going to a closed casket funeral and saying, let's just open her up. <laughs> Martha brings up a great point. Jesus, there will be a funk in the air. <laughs> it's been one, two, three, four days that the dude has been dead. They roll away the stone. Here we are. We are standing looking into this cave. We can now see a lifeless Lazarus. He is wrapped up. The text is clear. He is wrapped from head to toe. How surreal would that be? We are now looking into this tomb. Five days before, we were laughing, talking with Lazarus. Now we are looking at a lifeless Lazarus, all wrapped up. And Jesus gets even more ridiculous. He starts talking to the dead guy. He actually calls him by name. But this is where it gets interesting. 
Because the moment Jesus says his name, Jesus' voice becomes like a defibrillator to Lazarus' heart. You know what a defibrillator is? It's the clear, that's the thing in the hospital. Lazarus, clear, and oxygen fills Lazarus' lungs. That's freaky. That is a freaky thing when things that are dead begin to move. It is. I'm just stating the obvious. A while back, I, um, I went into my backyard and there was, a, there was a possum laying on the ground. And I want to apologize in advance for relating this to Jesus and the Bible. All right, I'm just going <laughs> to... This is so unnecessary. But anyway, um, I go in my backyard and there was this possum playing possum in my backyard. And uh, the guy looks like it's game over, all right? He's, he looks like he's done. Um, I want to make sure that he's done, because if he is, I'm going to relocate him to his final destination, which is my trash can. And so I, um, I get up really close to him, because I, I just want to make sure that he's not alive anymore. So I get up close and I'm looking at his side to see if I see the <gasps> nothing, nothing. I mean, like I have a staring contest with this guy who's not alive for a long time. Just like, are you sure? Okay. Cause I know you guys kind of do that thing. All right. <laughs> it's over. So I turn to go get my supplies, which is a broom and a dustpan. And I turn around, and the guy is just scampering along my fence. <laughs> Possums are normally harmless, but when I saw that, I did this. And I assumed a fighting position. <laughs> because if he just did that, no telling what he's going to do next. <laughs> no telling. It is weird when things that are dead begin to move. I guarantee you that day... There were full-grown men who jumped back. Lazarus, oh, hey, hey, stepping behind their friend like, hey, um, go give them fives. Tell them, tell them what's up. It's weird. Jesus calls him by name, and just the sound of his name fills his lungs with oxygen. I love what one commentator said. He said that if, if Jesus, had, Jesus had to specify Lazarus, because if he hadn't, all of the graves would have given up their dead. Can you imagine that? Come out. Everyone just, he's like, no, 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 I'm, I just meant Lazarus, my fault, my bad. Can you, that would have been crazy. But that's how powerful Jesus is. That just the words of his mouth bring the dead to life. Jesus calls Lazarus to come out. He comes out. And then I love that the text says he is bound up from head to toe. So don't picture Lazarus just strolling out like that was weird. All right, death is interesting. It's not like that. He is shuffling out. Here's Lazarus just... <laughs> No joke, he's just shuffling out of the tomb. And then he comes out and Jesus looks at the people standing around and he says, you guys, unwrap them. And as they begin to unwrap them, they get to a point, we're left to assume, that they unwrap him of all of his dead man's cloth and there is not a trace of death left on him. Here's why I love this story. First, I love this story because it is a beautiful picture of the gospel. This is the good news of Christianity. If you're not around church much, or maybe this is your first time back in a long time, or uh, you're just a visitor this morning, I want you to know that Christianity has incredible news for you, but it starts with bad news, and, and Lazarus illustrates that. Lazarus was in the tomb. His fate was final. No one was standing around like, if I know Lazarus, he's a fighter. He's going to bounce back from this one. Just, it's been four days, but just wait. He's going to bounce back. No, it was a done deal. The tomb was closed. His fate was final. 
And scripture is really clear that our fate is final without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our fate is final. If you're here wondering if you're right with God, you're not really sure, well, the, the Bible is really clear. If you don't have a relationship with God, you aren't right with God, and your fate at this moment, it is final. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter two about us before knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. He says this, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Before Jesus Christ, Paul is clear, you're not spiritually bad. To be spiritually bad implies that there's something that you could start doing by going to church, by living morally, there is something that you could start doing to make yourself spiritually good and therefore in good standing with God. Paul doesn't say you were spiritually bad, he says you were spiritually dead. There's absolutely nothing that you can do in your own power to make yourself right with God. He says you were by nature. This is what you came into. You were by nature children of wrath. But the bad news transitions to good news. Because when Lazarus' dead body intersected Jesus, Jesus called him by name, just like he calls each one of us by name. He calls us by name because he knows our names. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been, Jesus knows you more than you know you. He knows your name, he calls you by name. And when you sense that God is calling you by name and you respond in faith, meaning you come to this moment where you say, Jesus, I understand that you died on the cross for the sins of the world, but I need that to be personal for me. You didn't just die for their sins, you died for my sins. When you were on the cross, I was on your mind. All of my sin was actually taken by you and you paid the penalty for my sin. I need that to be personal for me. Jesus, I want you to be my savior. When you respond in faith, when Jesus calls, just as oxygen filled Lazarus' lungs, the spirit of God comes and fills your life. And the Bible's very clear, you are raised to a new life. This is the biggest difference between us and Lazarus. Lazarus was just brought back to life. It was the same life Just round two, the Bible's very clear. When we believe in Jesus, we come to life for the first time ever. Jesus Jesus describes it to Nicodemus as being born again. Paul describes it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Listen, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, The oldest passed away, behold, the new has come. I wonder if there's anyone in here who's desperately in need of a new start. When Jesus gets a hold of your life, there's times you might not feel new, you definitely won't look new, but you are new. Maybe you're in here this morning and you are in the midst of experiencing the pain and the brokenness that comes when you live a life apart from God. You need to know that you have a perfect heavenly father longing to give you a new, clean, fresh start if you'll simply respond in faith to what his son Jesus Christ has done for you. Lazarus comes to life Jesus calls him out, he comes out of the tomb, and as I said before, Jesus looks at the people standing around, he says, you guys unwrap them, and they begin to unwrap them to the point where there's not a trace of death left in his life. 
Second reason I love this story, first reason I love it is because it's a beautiful picture of the gospel. The second reason I love it is that it really is just a physical demonstration of the spiritual reality that he unpacked for Martha. Remember what Jesus said. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I don't know what you think life will be like after you die. I don't know what you think heaven will be like. I don't know what you think your body will be like. I don't know if you think you'll just be kind of like the angels kind of floating around in this kind of mystical experience. Paul is very clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that this physical body that is one day buried will one day be resurrected and perfected. And just as Lazarus' body was unwrapped of any trace of death, a day is coming where every single one of our lives, if we're a believer in Jesus Christ, it will be unwrapped completely of any trace of sin and death. Do you realize what that means? It means if you know Jesus in a personal way, a day is coming where there will be not a trace of sin in your life. No more struggle with sin After you die, no more dealing with temptation, no more guilt and shame for failure, from failure. But it also means this. It means cancer might put a believer in the ground, but it can't keep them there. It means a disability might keep a believer from walking or seeing or hearing this side of eternity, but it cannot keep a believer from running and singing and beholding for all of eternity. Why? Because a day is coming where this physical body will be resurrected and perfected. The perishable will put on the imperishable. The mortal will put on immortality. And the saying will be truth. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Because when you know Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, though you die, yet shall you live and your life will be unwrapped of any trace of sin and death. But remember what else Jesus said. He said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall I live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Lazarus comes out of the tomb. The people begin to unwrap him, and watch this. As the people unwrap him, he looks more and more alive and less and less dead. See, the beauty of Jesus being the resurrection and the life is that eternal life doesn't begin when you die, it begins when you believe. Here's what that means. You don't have to wait till the day you die, the the moment that you die, to begin experiencing an unwrapped life. Jesus is saying the unwrapping process can actually begin today. In fact, that's the normal Christian life. If you want to know what it looks like on a day-to-day basis to be a Christian, here's what it is. It means today you're a little bit more unwrapped than you were yesterday. Today you look a little bit more and more alive and a little less dead. That's what the Christian life is. It is a lifelong process of being unwrapped. It's a lifelong process of looking more and more alive and less and less dead. Now, here's what I want you to think about. What if Lazarus shuffled out of the tomb and he just kept shuffling? Like he never stopped to get unwrapped. Imagine that. What if Lazarus just went through life and never got unwrapped? He would go from being the miracle to the weird guy. Imagine Lazarus just shuffling down the frozen food aisle at H-E-B. It's like, there's a dead guy, Lazarus. That guy's weird. Imagine how much life Lazarus would have missed out on. I want to give you a, I want to give you a, a physical display of this. Mike, where are you? Mike, come on up here. Mike, if you're around, Janice, if you'll bring that up. Come on down here. Let's hear from Mike DiStefano, please. This is, uh, this is bubble wrap right here. Bubble wrap is a universal symbol for safety. We're all about that here at uh, Faith Bridge. If you'll take this, yeah. I'm just going to wrap you up. Welcome to Faith Bridge, everybody. <laughs> just a normal day at church, am I right? Just a guy getting wrapped. 
is what we do for fun in Waco, all right? <laughs> Blood's going to the head. <laughs> How you doing? You want me to start spinning? Yeah, why don't you spin? Help a brother out, all right? <laughs> That's... Always get someone to do the work for you if you can. That's my motto. All right, that's good, Mike. All right, yeah, you look great. I want you to think about this. Uh, what if this was Mike's life? That's ridiculous, right? I mean, that, 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 that's ridiculous. But just imagine, go with me for a second. What if this was Mike's life? Just imagine, imagine going to lunch with Mike. And Mike's just the, the creepy weird guy standing, at the, standing by the table and you're just having to put food in his mouth as you guys talk. How's ministry going, all right? Imagine Mike on his wedding day. It's like you may kiss your bride and his bride's like, I'm good. <laughs> Imagine Mike in, in seminary. He's just, he's just the bubble wrap guy in the corner. Think about how much life Mike would miss out on. Now, here's the thing. We look at this and be like, this is ridiculous. This is, this is a dumb illustration because Mike would never live like this. Here's the crazy thing. For so many of us, this is our lives because Jesus Christ has raised us to a new life and we go day in, day out, allowing our lives to be all wrapped up by sin. And we miss out on life. I mean, just think about it. There are people here this morning, your life is so wrapped up by anger, bitterness, and resentment towards someone who hurt you. And here's the thing, you feel entitled to that anger, bitterness, and resentment. It's what you feel you deserve and what you have a right to. Well, let me just say this. Who do you think is getting hurt the most by your anger, bitterness, and resentment? It's not the guy that you're mad at. The person getting hurt the most is you. I promise you. I would imagine that there's many of us here, our lives are all wrapped up in jealousy, in envy, because we spend every day wishing that we were a little bit, like, a little bit less like ourselves and a little bit more like the people right next to us. If we could just be a little bit more like the person in the office next door, if we could just be a little bit more like the people who live down the street, then life would be better. So you entered this, this place in life where there's, there's actually self-hate. You hate who you are. You are missing out on life. I think many of us wrap our lives, if we're honest in here, we wrap our lives in lies or half-truths or exaggeration about who we are, what we have, and what we've accomplished. And we do it because we want people to love us approve of us and accept us. Do you realize, though, that if people love you, accept you, and approve of you, they're not loving, accepting, and approving of you. They're loving, accepting, and approving of a manufactured version of you. So if you're asking the question, am I loved, you have no clue. And that's a, that's a miserable place to be. the fear of if you were truly fully known, would you even be loved? And you're missing out on life. Some of our lives are wrapped up in lust. We constantly escape to this fantasy world, and you know what that fantasy world does? It breeds discontentment in your reality, in your real relationships. I promise you, you're missing out on life. See, Jesus came so that we could experience, we could begin to experience an unwrapped life. That we could begin to experience life now. See, when we let Jesus go to work in our lives and begin to unwrap us, I just just want you to think about this. Imagine, Imagine how good Mike feels now just that his head is freed up. You know when something's just on you and then it's removed, it's like freedom. 
I mean, the rest of his body is still wrapped up, yet he's, he's begun to taste freedom. Just imagine, instead of a life of anger, bitterness, and resentment, there's the freedom of forgiveness. As Jesus begins to unwrap your life a little bit more, I mean, just think about this. Here, now we're, we're getting after the, the feet, Mike's legs. Just imagine when he can start moving those feet around a little bit more, just the freedom that he begins to start feeling. Imagine this, instead of a life of, of jealousy and envy, there's the freedom of contentment. Instead of a life wrapped up in control, which we talked about last week, there's the freedom of peace. As Jesus unwraps our lives more, instead of I mean, just think, okay, yeah, that's good. You just feel free, you want to stretch, do a jumping jack or two, just because you can now? <laughs> just imagine this, instead of a life, you can applaud for Mike, you did a great job. <laughs> Go ahead, man, thanks, dude, appreciate it. Just imagine, instead of a life wrapped up in lies and half-truths and exaggerations, there's the freedom of truly being fully known and fully loved. Imagine instead of a life wrapped up in lust, which is always selfish and it always hurts, imagine a life of, of pure love, which is selfless and it blesses. There is life waiting. My question for you this morning is what areas of your life do you still look dead? In what areas of your life are you still wrapped up? Missing out on life because of sin. What, in what areas of your life do you still look dead? It is time to be unwrapped. And let me just say this. If there was ever a reason why you should get past just being a Sunday attender at Faith Bridge and you should step into a little bit more uh, commitment to this church, it's because of this. Just like in Lazarus' life, Jesus often does the most unwrapping through his people. That's what church is. It is a group of people journeying through life together, helping one another look more and more alive and less and less dead. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He is the one and only one who can raise us to a new life that begins now and lasts for all of eternity. So now it comes back to the question that Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this? That key word is this. He doesn't say, do you believe that being morally above average is a good thing? Do you believe that Attending church is, is the best thing. Do you believe that having Jesus as one slice of the pie in your life is a good thing? No, Jesus says, do you believe this? That if you want to experience life in heaven with God for all of eternity, it's going to have everything to do with Jesus. That if you really want to start to live now, it's going to have everything to do with Jesus. Jesus declares, I'm the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever believes in me and lives will never die. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you for who you are and for what you've done. That you have come to give us life that begins now and lasts for all of eternity thankful, Lord, that for those of us who believe in you, it is only going to get better, Lord. We can begin to be unwrapped now, and a day is coming where we will experience a life where there is not a trace of sin and death. Lord, I pray for my friends in here who don't know you in a personal way. I pray that today they might come to know you and answer the question, yes, I believe this. We love you. We need you. Every single one of us has areas of our lives that we still look dead. God, would you go to work and begin unwrapping us? In Jesus' name.